place in the gospel records where the Bible says that it was noise that he was in the house. And when they knew that he was in the house, he could not be hid. I'll tell you what I've learned about revival. I have learned, first of all, that it's not a meeting. It's a moving of God. That preachers don't bring it. The Holy Spirit sends it. That you cannot hype it. And when it comes, you cannot hide it. So nobody can work up revival. That's impossible. If you're trying to work it up, it's not of God. It's just religious flesh and masquerading as a move of God. It's a cheap substitute. But when the Spirit of the living God exalts Jesus in our eyes, you really are never the same. And that is what we want the Lord to do in our hearts. We're rejoicing this morning in the souls that came to Christ to be saved. That's glorious, but let's just get real for a moment. Revival doesn't start with the lost people getting saved. It starts with saved people getting right. And so, for the next three nights, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want us to let the searchlight of the Word of God, the, the x-ray machine of the Holy Ghost, turn the light on our souls and pray that the Lord will make us the people He intended for us to be. I think there's a ball game going on somewhere tonight. Isn't that right? And I want you to know something. I would ten times rather be gathered with the people of God than to be anywhere else at this moment. In fact, I was sitting there thinking, where would you like to be? You, you tell me. Where would you like to be if the trumpet sounded, let's say, at uh, 7.15 tonight? I'll tell you where I'd like to be. I'd like to be gathered with God's people worshiping Jesus. And I want you to understand something, that any moment we may see the lovely face of the Son of God. With that in mind, I bring you to our verse tonight. Would you open the Word of God with me again to Revelation chapter number 1? How many of you read Revelation 1 today? Would you raise your hand, please? You read it? That's great. This is a crowd of overachievers. I commend you. Well, do it again tonight. Do it again tomorrow morning before you come to the evening meeting tomorrow if the Lord tarries is coming. By the way, if Jesus comes before tomorrow night, we will not be meeting in this auditorium. We're going to be meeting in a much better location. Isn't that right? But if the Lord tarries, we're going to have a great time in the Word. And we come tonight to one verse, Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 7. Would you read the verse out loud with me, church? Revelation 1, verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I want you to read it like you mean it this time, all right? I've heard nursing homes more, more vocal than that. So let's, let's turn it up a notch or two with Holy Ghost enthusiasm. As a matter of fact, it will probably help you if you read it to a fellow sinner. So turn and look at the sinner that you're seated next to right now. If it helps you, get your preaching finger out and point at that sinner, and let's read it. Ready? Here we go. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, I want you to take your pen tonight, and I want you to mark something in your Bible. At the end of verse number 6, where we left off earlier on this Lord's Day, there is a word. What is the last word of verse 6, church? Amen. amen. And then you come to the last word of verse number 7. Amen. amen. How many of you ever said amen in church in your whole life? Would you raise your hand, please? It's all right to say amen. Did you know it's all right to say amen? Now, I will say this. You shouldn't say it lightly, and you shouldn't say it flippantly, because amen is not just a word. Amen is actually a name. Did you know it's one of the names for Jesus? He is God's amen to us. How do you know your sins are forgiven? I've got the Lord's amen on that. How do you know you have everlasting life? I have the Lord's amen on that. In other words, amen is a word of assurance, a word of agreement. It is a word of certainty. And may I just say that God's people must always live on divine certainties. There are things I do not know. I have no idea, no idea what Washington is going to do this week. Only Jesus knows what Washington's going to do this week. I have no idea what 
what the financial markets are going to do tomorrow. I have no idea what world governments are going to do. I have no idea the timing of the Lord's return. There are many things I do not know, but let me tell you what I know for sure. I know that God is always true, and everything he foretells, he always fulfills. And you can say amen to that. Every now and then, it's good for us to give a good hearty amen back to the Lord. In fact, let me show you something really interesting. In the first amen, verse number 6, the first amen is an amen about what he has done. Do you remember what he's done? Look back at the previous verses. He, he has loved us. He has washed us from our sins in his own blood. He has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Amen, amen, amen to all of that. Aren't you glad for what the Lord has done in your life? But if your testimony for Jesus is all past tense, then you've got a past tense God. Our God's not a past tense God. And when you come to verse number 7, we move now to where we're living and to where we're going. And the amen in verse number 7 has to do with what he will do. May I tell you something tonight? As surely as God has... God will. As surely as he was, he is at work at this present hour. Now, the amen in verse number 6, I believe to be John's spirit-inspired amen. The, the Lord is basically giving, giving his assurance of all these things. But when you come to the end of verse number 7, you have another spirit-inspired amen, but here it is John's response to what the Lord has promised. This is beautiful. It is almost like Heaven shouts out, Amen! And John, sitting down, poor old John, lonely John, sitting on the Isle of Patmos, looks back to heaven and says, Amen, Lord. God says, this is what I'm going to do. And John says, I believe it. Jesus says, I promise. And lonely John says, I can't see it, but I'm taking that by faith. I would point out to you that the amen comes before all he is about to see. Look, we'll come to the revelation of Jesus Christ, and then you got the revelation of all these events, but all of that hasn't transpired yet. This is the beginning of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Please don't miss this. We walk by faith and not by sight. Maybe you haven't seen it, but you're going to see it, and you can believe it now, and you ought to lend your amen to John's amen, because everything God says you can take to the bank. It is impossible for God to lie. Let me tell you where we're living. We're living between two amens. That's where we're living. We're living between the Lord's amen and the final amen. And tonight, for a few moments, I want to just zero in on one verse. When we're done, one verse. And it is verse number seven. There is a lot of truth wrapped up in this verse. The first amen is God's assurance, and the second is our agreement with Him. What, what is this word amen? Let me tell you what it is. It's a positive word in negative days. We're living in negative times. In fact, it's very easy to get sad and depressed and disillusioned, right? And every now and then, you've got to just get your eyes back on Jesus and remind yourself God's still God, and God knows what He's doing, and God still has everything under control. So what do we know? The word amen is really the word yes. We don't use the word amen a lot today except in church settings. But we do use the word yes. Yes, with certainty. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe this. Are you confident? Yes, I'm confident of it. This is wonderful. Right here in a book that has so many dark things coming, so many judgments, the wrath of Almighty God getting ready to be poured out, the Lord begins with the divine yeses. Aren't you glad we have God's yeses? All the promises of God in Christ are yea, that's yes, and in Him, amen to the glory of God by us. So what are the divine amens? What are the divine yeses in this verse? There are three of them. Would you write them down? I want you to write them down so that you'll chew on them long after this message is over and the preacher's voice is silent. What do we say amen to? Number one, yes, amen. Number one, Christ is coming. Amen. Look at verse number seven. Behold, that's a great word. It literally means look. All through Scripture, we're commanded to watch, to be sober, to be on guard. Why? He's coming as a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming, but we know he's coming. So keep your eyes on the eastern sky. When was the last time you walked outside and looked up in the sky and thought Jesus might step out on that cloud today? 
When was the last time you lived a day thinking today could be the day? When was the last time you went to bed at night and the last thought as your head hit the pillow was Christ could come in the middle of the night tonight? God's people ought to be living with that kind of expectancy that's rooted in faith. There ought to be some holy anticipation that any moment we might see the Lord Jesus Christ. See, the greatest day you're ever going to live is the day you see Jesus face to face. I hear people say sometimes, well, preacher... I think my best days are behind me. Let me use a good West Virginia theological term for that. Hogwash. It's ridiculous. Because the best day you're ever going to live as a Christian is the day you see Jesus face to face. Which means it doesn't matter how old you are, how low you are, how hard you have it right now. Your best day is still ahead of you because we know, amen, yes to this, Christ is coming for us. Look. Before I give you these thoughts, go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15 just a moment. Would you please? I was thinking about this sitting on the front row a moment ago. I thought, behold, what a word that is, behold. It shows up all through Scripture. It's a word that grabs attention, that turns attention heavenward. Did you know in the great resurrection chapter we find that word? Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. What's the first word of 1 Corinthians 15, 51? What is it, church? Behold. Mark it in your Bible. Look. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's a fascinating phrase, isn't it? In the twinkling of an eye. They say the blink of an eye is about... A third of a second, something like that. The twinkling of an eye is a billionth of a second. Ponder that just a moment. By the way, frequently the eye is associated with the second coming of Christ. Keep that in mind. You're going to remember that in just a moment when we go back to Revelation. Uh, But the twinkling of an eye, they tell me, is the time it takes light. You know how fast light travels. It's the time it takes light to enter into the front of the eye, go to the back of the eye, bounce off, and come back out. Look, that's faster, much faster than the blink of an eye. You say, well, I'll I'll wait till closer when Jesus comes to get right with God. Brother, you got the twinkling of an eye. You better not wait because that's faster than anything you ever imagined. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall see Jesus. And what do we know about the coming of Christ? We'll go back to our verse, Revelation 1, verse 7, and notice that His coming is announced. Behold, look, He says, pay attention. It's not only announced, look at it carefully, it's certain. Behold, He cometh. Everything God says is sure. He said it, He announced it. And so it's certain. Keep reading. Behold, He cometh with clouds. Now we know He's coming suddenly. We learned that earlier today, quickly. In fact, go to the last page of your Bible. Go to Revelation 22. We'll come back to this chapter in a moment. But you might want to mark this in your Bible. Revelation 22, verse 7. Behold, there's that word again. I come quickly. Mark that. Verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. A third time, verse 20. He was testified these things. says, surely I come quickly. And there is the amen. But mark it, verse 7, verse 12, and verse 20. Not once, not twice, three times he says he's coming quickly. That does not mean, watch this carefully, that does not mean soon. I believe he's coming soon. I believe he's coming in our lifetime. But every generation since the, since the first coming of Christ has believed in the soon return of our Lord. In fact, best I can tell, there's only one of the early apostles that didn't believe Jesus would come back in his lifetime, and that was Peter. And the only reason he didn't believe it is because Jesus already told him how he was going to die. And so he knew he was going to die, and that's how he was going to meet the Lord. But best you can tell, the rest of them were all living with the anticipation any moment the trumpet could sound and our Lord could return. The Bible word quickly does not mean soon it's not a a time element it means suddenly it means when it happens it will happen so fast you will have no time to change anything so let me ask you a personal question if you knew that at 7 30 tonight instead of the preacher being done and we all have our prayer and say amen if you knew at 7 30 tonight the trumpet was going to sound And a shout would ring out from heaven. And at 7.30, you'd meet Jesus. What would you do between now and 7.30? 
Anything? Is there any loved one you'd want to call? Anything you'd want to talk to God about? Any restitution to be made? Anything, anything you don't want to meet Jesus with in judgment, you'd rather meet him with in mercy. Is there anything like that in your mind right now? Are you waiting for me to tell you what it is? I'm not God. I don't know your business. I got my own junk to worry about. No, the Holy Ghost is going to have to tell you what it is in your heart, what sin is separating between you and your God. I'm asking you right now, is there anything in your life right now that ought to be cared for? Well, I want to tell you, that's exactly what you ought to take care of tonight because quickly, suddenly, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Christ is coming, yes, and amen to that. But don't miss this. Go back to our verse, verse 7. He's not just coming. He's coming in the cloud. I want you just to meditate on that with me for a moment. Why the clouds? I think there's several reasons for this. The most obvious is that's the way he went up. Do you remember Acts chapter number 1? He's standing there. <laughs> Can you imagine? Use a little sanctified imagination. He's standing there just talking to those boys, and all of a sudden he starts rising off the ground. I mean, they've already seen him walk through doors, rise from the dead. They've not seen it on this fashion before. And he's rising up, and suddenly a cloud. Read Acts chapter 1. A cloud receives him out of their sight. And they're standing there with their mouths wide open, dumbfounded. And an angel shows up and said, why are you gazing up into heaven? That's quite a question, isn't it? What, wouldn't you be gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. That means Christ Left here visibly, he's coming back visibly. He, he left bodily, he's coming back bodily. He left personally, he's coming back personally. He left in a cloud and he's coming back in a cloud. Now why is the cloud significant other than the fact that was the way he ascended? Would you write a couple things down here just, just to meditate on a little bit tonight about the, the soon return of our Lord Jesus? One reason is... Uh, that the cloud reminds us of where he has been. May I tell you where Jesus has been? He's been beyond the veil. He's been in what we might call the third heaven. You know, the first heaven you see by day, that's, that's where the birds fly. The, the second heaven you see only by night, that's where the stars are and the moon is but the third heaven right now we see only by faith. But I'm going to tell you, church, the third heaven is just as real. No, no, it's more real than the first and second heaven. And it is much more wonderful. And that's where Jesus is at this present moment. Where is he? He's there preparing a place for us. Where is he? He's there seated at the right hand of the heavenly Father. He's praying for me. Whew. Praise God. Jesus is praying for me tonight. Jesus is praying for you tonight. And someday soon, the heavenly Father is going to look over at his son and say, it's time. And Jesus is going to get up off that throne. Can you imagine the scene when Jesus gets up off that throne? And suddenly, Jesus Christ is going to step out on a cloud and people are going to know who he is. The cloud reminds us of where he is at this moment. That's not all. The cloud reminds us of who he is. Do you remember that all through the Old Testament, God led his people by a cloud? The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. Do you remember that the, the Shekinah glory cloud of God would come down out of heaven and would reside on that tabernacle, would sit down on the temple, would come into the Holy of Holies? Oh, you ought to read the book of Chronicles. I know it's nobody's favorite book, but you ought to read the book of Chronicles. There were moments that the Shekinah glory cloud of God came in and was so powerful and pervasive, it filled the whole place and nobody could do anything but stand still in the presence of the thrice holy God. I'm going to tell you something. When God enters in with his glory, there's nothing in this world like it. And I got good news for you. That is not some far off distant thing. Very shortly, the glory cloud of God is coming. Jesus is coming in that cloud for his church. I think there's also a practical reason. You know what clouds represent? They represent what comes between. Let me tell you what clouds do. They hide. I fly almost every week of my life, and many a day, many a day, I've gone to an airport, cloudy, rainy, nasty, and drug myself onto a plane and sat down and thought, man, this is a terrible travel day. This is nasty. And they taxi out and take off, 
And in just a few moments, it, it breaks through the clouds and suddenly the sun was shining. Did you know the sun was shining up there the whole time? I just couldn't see it. Oh, I love this. There's going to come a moment, not where we break through, but where he breaks through. You, you don't break through to God. God breaks through to you. You don't reach Him. He reaches you. And I say, Christ is coming. And when He comes, the Bible says, every eye shall see. Now, let's go back to what we said this morning. It's my conviction that our Lord's coming will come in two phases. The first phase is what we typically refer to as the rapture of the church. He's coming in the air. He's coming in the clouds. We'll be caught away, snatched away to be with Him. That sets in motion seven years of literally all of hell's power unleashed on this planet and during that seven years, where will we be? We're going to be at the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me just tell you, you'd much rather be in heaven during those seven years than here on this earth. And at the end of the seven years, Christ is coming back to set up His throne to rule and to reign. Here's the really good part. We're coming back with Him. In fact, if I had time, I'd tell you the end of the revelation and show you the return of our Lord. And we're all coming with Him, and we're all in white garments when we come. I was studying that a while back, and I thought, this is unusual because He's coming to a battle. Isn't that right? I mean, quite a battle. The battle to beat all battles. And here we are, the armies of heaven coming with Him. And all of us have on white linen garments. How many of you think that doesn't sound like camo? <laughs> and I thought to myself, I wonder why we're all in white linen garments coming back for the battle. Would you like to know? Because you're not going to fight in that battle. You're not going to need to. No, no. We're going to be spectators of the mighty power of God, and Jesus is going to speak a word, and it will all be over. Christ is coming! And there is inside of me, and I think inside every true believer, the yes of the Holy Ghost, the amen of heaven that says, oh yes, I believe that's true. Oh yes, I love His appearing. Oh yes, I long to see Him. Look, if you don't want to see Jesus, you better check your relationship to Jesus because you love to see people show up that you love. And I tell you, the first great amen is that Christ is coming. Let me give you a second amen. Go back to our verse, Revelation 1, verse 7. Yes, Christ is coming. And then number two, yes, the world will weep. Yes, the world will weep. Look at the verse carefully. The Bible says he cometh with the clouds, and every eye, there's the eye again, shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Their eyes are not only going to see, their eyes are going to weep. At this present hour, the world mocks our Christian faith. This present hour, those who live in unbelief and want to detract from the truth of Scripture, let me tell you what they do. They laugh. But you hear me carefully. Very shortly, their laughter will turn to weeping. For us, it'll be the exact opposite. You ever think about this? The Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. For the child of God, the only weeping and mourning you're going to know is on this side. And when the Lord Jesus comes, all of your weeping is going to turn into laughter. How many of you think that sounds pretty good? Yes? But for those who do not know Jesus, it will be all of their laughter turns to weeping. we got a world right now that's laughing its way to hell. They're entertained. I sat there the other day afternoon in a, in a restaurant in South Florida by myself going from place to place and just grabbing a bite to eat and I was surrounded by snowbirds by the way the, the older I get the more I understand the snowbirds you know and there's mostly older people seated all around me and because I was alone and no one there in conversation I could hear all these conversations going on all these tables around me and I'm going to tell you preacher it's one of the saddest things I've ever experienced Broke my heart. I sat there listening to these people who are here at the end of life now. They're on the tail end of it all, still trying to figure out what it's all about. I heard them talking, laughing about things, and joking about things that grieve the heart of God. I watched them drinking their liquor and blaspheming the name of Jesus, and I thought, these people are going to meet God someday. Wait a minute, we're all going to meet God someday. See, people want to go to a church, makes you feel good, makes you laugh. We don't need more laughter. 
We meet, need more weeping. That's what we need. Whatever happened to the tears? Whatever happened to brokenness over sin? When was the last time you heard somebody weeping over a soul? I was in a church not long ago, and God really moved among us. And I, I don't even remember exactly where I was. I'm trying to remember. At the end of the meeting, people praying and seeking the Lord. And there was a, there was a dear saint there, a woman, way up in years. But she was a, a woman that knew God. I, you could tell this woman knew God. And I, I'm going to tell you, it's been a long time, a long time in church since I've heard anybody weep and wail like that woman did. And I'm sure there were some young people there who were a little embarrassed by it. I wasn't embarrassed. I thought, dear God, give us more of that. Where are the weepers? Where are those that go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, that will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them? We don't need more entertainment. We need more burden for souls. That's what we need. By the way, if they're going to weep someday for their soul, don't you think we ought to weep for their souls now? Yes, Christ is coming. That's glorious. That's wonderful. Praise God. But wait a minute. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. The same thing that brings us consolation ought to bring us conviction. The two-edged sword of the Word of God brings us the great comfort that we belong to Jesus. And this world is not our home. We're just passing through. And, and God is going to take care of all the enemies in the end. That's a glorious comfort. But at the same moment, it brings this conviction that we have this short little window of time to get the gospel out and get sinners in why on earth are we living like we're going to be here forever when we're standing on the edge of the second coming of Jesus Christ it's easy to say amen to the Christ is coming maybe we should say amen God help us to the fact the world will weep look at the verse carefully why will they weep well, they'll weep because of their guilt. And we see here the depth of their guilt. Look at it carefully. The Bible says, They also which pierced him. Jesus is pierced. His head was pierced with a crown of thorns. His, his hands and his feet pierced with spikes. His side pierced with a spear. He was pierced, 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 pierced in every way. Five different types of wounds the human body can experience and Jesus had all five of them medical doctors say do you understand that someday in heaven we will look at the scars of Jesus someone said years ago the only man made thing in heaven are the scars in the hands of Jesus I have often wondered if Jesus will, will show us as he did Thomas it's not that we'll need to see them then but I wonder if Jesus will show us I did this for you now, for those who, who know him, we love him, and we say, thank you, Jesus. But for those who do not know him, he's not friend, he's enemy. They, they've taken a position of enmity against God. So when they see the scars in the hands and feet of Jesus, instead of rejoicing, they will tremble on that day. Interpretationally, specifically, this begins with the nation of Israel. By the way, I love Israel. I love going to Israel. I love studying the Bible in Israel. I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I still believe the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Speaking as a Gentile, I'm glad for the second part also to the Greek. Amen to that? But I still believe that God wants those people to know him. I was preaching in California a few weeks ago, and a woman came up to me after the meeting. She was, had tears in her eyes, and she said, Preacher, I just want to tell you, she said, I am a, a Messianic Jew. I'm a, I'm a true believer. I'm a Jewish woman. But she said, I know who Jesus is. And I rejoiced, and I thought how that must rejoice the heart of Jesus. Oh, may the Lord save them. Pray for Israel, friends. While you're at it, pray for America to stay peaceable to Israel. Would you do that, please? And I want you to know someday that nation that by and large has rejected Christ will have to recognize who he is. Go back in your Bible just for a second to the Old Testament book of Zechariah. Would you go to Zechariah with me for a moment? Do you know where Zechariah is in your Bible? I think your pastor is preaching through the minor prophets right now, right? And they're not minor in message, they're just minor in size. Go to the end of your Bible and go back just a few pages. You'll find Zechariah chapter number 12. It's where the pages still stick together. I promise you that. It's still white and clean. <laughs> Look at Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. See, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. 
God said this before Jesus ever came the first time that this would happen. Look at Zechariah 12 and verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. In other words, there's coming a day that God will bring repentance to them. There's coming a day that God will humble them and turn their hearts. Oh, glorious day when Israel finally recognizes who their Messiah is. Look at the next phrase. And they shall look upon me whom they have what? Pierced. Would you mark Zechariah 12 and verse 10 in your Bible and connect it to Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 7 because he's simply saying those who crucified me, those who rejected me, those who cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord and then turned right around and said, crucify him. They will see me on that day and remember and know who I am. But may I suggest to you this is not just Israel. It's my conviction that all of our sins were responsible for Jesus going to the cross, which means that every sinner is, in a way, one of those who pierced Jesus. Do you understand Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures? And on that day, the world will weep. you think you've heard weeping? Have you ever been in a room where some awful tragedy has taken place, where some loved one has been taken. Have you ever been in a place and heard the wail, the deep wail? I'm not talking about quiet tears. I'm talking about the out loud wailing of someone in grief. I've been there. It's awful. It's awful. But I'm going to tell you, you've never seen tears or heard wailing like you will hear on the day that people realize who Jesus is and recognize they missed him. Imagine the hopeless despair of men and women and young people who now stare a Christless eternity in the face. Oh God, help us to hear now the weeping of a lost world. They may laugh on the surface, but they weep in private places and wonder where they're going when they die and what life is all about, and how they can have peace with God. Do you hear the cries of lost humanity? Christ heard them. We must hear them. Amen, Lord. Christ is coming. Amen, Lord. The world will weep. There's a third thing. Did you ever notice the final words of verse number 7? John speaks, and he says, even so. Amen. Do you know what the words even so mean? Even so is John saying to the Lord, Lord, just like you said and just as quickly as possible. You know, these are, these are the words of a man who's ready to meet Jesus. Let me give you a third yes and we'll be done. Yes, Christ is coming. Yes, the world will weep. Yes, the people of God must prepare. I come full circle back to what I asked you a few moments ago. Are you ready to meet him like you are right now? Are you ready? Is there anything shoo, the Holy Ghost of God puts His finger on, sends an arrow from heaven to your heart and says, that's got to go. That needs to be done. They asked Martin Luther one day, they said, Mr. Luther, you're planning an, planning an apple tree today. He said, yes, planning an apple tree today. They said, if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do today? And he smiled and said, plant my apple tree. And they said, well, that doesn't sound like a very spiritual response. He said, as far as I know, I've left nothing undone. I'm ready to meet Jesus like I am right now. Oh, would to God we were ready. When Joshua marched into the promised land, the Bible says in the book of Joshua that he left nothing undone of all that God had commanded Moses. Wouldn't it be great to finish your journey and meet Jesus and know that you weren't perfect, but you left nothing undone that God told you to do? Is there anything God's told you to do? A few years ago, a woman came to me on the last night of a revival meeting, weeping, and she said to me, Preacher, she said, I was sitting in the service last night, and the Holy Spirit brought my sister's face to my mind. And she said, You don't know me and don't know my sister. She said, I've been a dedicated member of this church for decades. But she said, 20 years ago, my sister and I had a falling out, and we've not talked for 20 years. 20 years. She said, I went home last night, and she said, I tried to read my Bible, couldn't read my Bible. She said, I tried to pray and couldn't pray. She said, I tried to go to bed and couldn't sleep. And she said, in the wee hours of the morning, I thought, I can't live like this, and I don't want to meet God with this. And she said, I called my sister. And she started laughing through her tears. And she said, wouldn't you know God had been working on her too? 
And she said, early this morning, we hours in the morning, over the phone, my sister and I got right with God and right with each other. And she said to me, it's been the most glorious day all day today. Is there anything like that you need to care for? Maybe a negative that needs to go? Maybe a positive that needs to come? Is there, is there anything that's there that shouldn't be? Anything lacking that, that should be there? Are you ready to meet God like you are? They asked John Wesley, same thing. They said, Mr. Wesley, you, you got a full slate of meetings? Oh, yes, full slate of meetings. They said, well, what if Jesus was coming tomorrow? What would you do? And he pulled his calendar, his diary journal, out of his saddlebag, and he opened it to, to tomorrow, and he read his schedule for the next day and smiled and said, I'd do that. And they said, you wouldn't change anything? He said, as far as I know, I don't need to change anything because I'm doing what God has given me to do, and I'm ready to meet the Lord like I am right now. Preaching one night on a Wednesday night, a woman came forward weeping. And she told the pastor, she said, I've been saved, but I've never been scripturally baptized since I was saved. Pastor said, we'll take care of it on Sunday. I said, I'll never forget this. Place was full. She raised her hand. She said, no, sir. I thought, this is going to be interesting. She's weeping. She said, i got to get baptized tonight. He said, but the baptistry water's cold. We hadn't turned the heater on. We'll have it warm on Sunday. She raised her hand again. She said, if it's all the same with you. She said, I've been disobeying God for years. I don't want to go to bed another night having disobeyed God. I'll get baptized in cold water. And we all sat down and watched her get baptized in freezing cold water. Somebody said, that's crazy stuff. No, that's somebody that wants to be right with God and ready to meet God at any moment. May I say to you, it's not just about you. Let's not be so stinking selfish to think revival is just about us. Do you know why God awakens this church? So they can reach the world. The preparation of God's people is not just us being right and us being ready. It's us reaching the lost. See, anybody that wants to study Revelation, talk prophecy, and doesn't want to go after sinners, they miss the whole point of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. I'll end here. Go to the last page of your Bible again one more time to Revelation chapter 22 and look at verse number 17. Did you ever notice that on the last page of Scripture there's an invitation, a gospel invitation? What, what a picture of the grace and mercy of God. Look at Revelation 22, verse number 17. God speaking. And the Spirit and the bride say what? Come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come and oh here we are by the way i'm a whosoever will preacher if you hadn't figured that out by now i'm a whosoever will preacher because jesus is a whosoever will savior god loves all people christ died for every man i believe the free offer of salvation ought to be made to every sinner on this planet they're not all going to be saved but they all ought to have the opportunity to accept or reject jesus and here it is and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely come 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 can i point something out to you look at verse 17 the bride, that's us, we're supposed to be saying the exact same thing the Holy Spirit's saying. Would you like to know what the Holy Spirit's doing to sinners tonight? Look here, come to Jesus. Come on, come to Jesus. Can I tell you what Christians, those who've already heard and received, ought to be doing? They ought to be saying to sinners, come to Jesus. Come on, come to Jesus. You need Jesus, come to Jesus. Where are the pleaders for souls? Where are they in this church? Anybody plead for souls in this church? Where are the watchers among us? I said, watchers? They asked Mr. Spurgeon. One day, he was having as many people saved in their gospel meetings. They gave a little different presentation as far as invitations went than we would be accustomed to. But they're having so many people saved. And somebody said, what's the secret of that? He said, I got people in this church who are spirit-filled Christians, and they watch for people. And when they see somebody under conviction, they go to that person when the service is done. And he said, most of the people that get saved here get saved not because of a sermon, but because somebody who was watching for souls went after that person for Jesus. Any watchers for souls in this church? I'm thinking of a man in Knoxville, Tennessee years ago. And I, every time I ever preached there, he was standing in the back of the church. I mean, standing in the back of the church. And you know what he's doing? Watching for souls. I can't tell you how many hundreds of people I watched that man walk down the aisle. He'd go to them. He wouldn't pressure anybody. He'd go to them, put his arm around somebody and say, we love you. And Jesus wants to save you. Would you like to be saved today? And I've watched people weep. And him walk them down the aisle. Where are those people? Must I go in empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so not one soul with which to greet Him? Must I empty-handed go? I'm standing here right now preaching to you, but I'm thinking about a man, a neighbor of mine, who needs Jesus that I've been praying for. Dear God, don't let him go to hell. 
What are we going to do to get people to Jesus? Because the window's closing. The sands of time are falling quickly through the glass. And in a moment, we shall see Christ. Christ is coming and the world is weeping and God's people must be preparing. And look how Revelation ends. Look at verse number 20. He which testifieth these things says, Surely I come quickly. What's the next word, church? Huh. Amen. And look if this sounds familiar. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Could you in good conscience look up to heaven tonight and say, Jesus, I'm ready for you to come right now. As far as I know, there's nothing else that needs to be cared for. Come on right now. Because if there's anything you need to care for to make that possible, you should do it now. You should lend your amen to God's amen in Jesus Christ.